because I just uh, dragged out a portion of the presentation that I actually do. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cover this portion because this is uh, parts of the methodology. So um, the, the thing that I'm, um, where did our questionnaire do go, please? Right? I went back. Yeah, okay, good. So, yeah. yeah, okay, I understand. So, um, so, so what I decided to do is just, like, just show you, right, parts of the methodology. Not, not the whole thing, but because that'll take a while. But, um, so, I like models. I really like models because, as I've told some people who have heard this before, right, models help me deal with the complexity of systems. They help me ignore the complexities of systems, right? Yeah. And, and, but one of the problems with models is they actually uh, cause you to ignore the complexities of systems. Uh, in, in generally, they um, they work fairly well. So, um, so I have this model, and this is basically a model of a system. And, and this one is uh, tuned for a Java system. Uh, and, and so the, the whole idea here is that I want to identify who the dominating consumers of the CPU are. And then what I mean by dominating consumers is not the thing that's consuming the CPU, but the thing that's controlling how the CPU is being consumed. Okay. And, um, and you can see in here I've got a number of different layers in, the, in our model. And the other thing that I think is interesting, an interesting point is that the, our end users are actually part of our model. And they necessarily have to be part of our model. Um, which means that we're actually modeling them too. And if you get into test systems then really what you're doing is you're taking the yellow layer on top and you're creating a model of a model in order to like drive load on the entire stack. Okay, so in terms of dominating consumers and uh, using this particular um, methodology, um, we have a number of, of uh, different candidates. Um, the first one is none, so we have no dominating consumer of the CPU. We have another one which we call system, another one for JVM, and another one for application. Okay, and so the way this all works is that if our system is not meeting its uh, agreed upon SLAs, like its latency uh, requirements um, or throughput requirements, then what we need to do is we need to figure out why. What is in the system that's preventing your application from meeting the SLAs? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first ask the question, is the kernel uh, portion of the total CPU usage or, uh, greater than 10% of the user portion of the CPU utilization. And if that's true, then I'm going to declare the system to be the dominating consumer of the CPU. If the system is the dominating consumer of the CPU, then what I want is tools to help me investigate that particular problem. Here's a list of tools that I would use to investigate the, this class of problems. Okay? So, um, from the model, we get the methodology. From the methodology, uh, we get a, a taxonomy for the performance problems. And from the taxonomy, uh, we get an understanding of what tools we would have to use in order to discover uh, the underlying root cause from that taxonomy. Okay? Cool. Um, if we're in this situation, uh, where we can't actually saturate the CPU, then I'm going to declare that we have no dominating consumer. And when we have no dominating consumer, this is usually the result of some sort of starvation. Generally, uh, it shows up as thread starvation. That's how it will manifest itself. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to do some sort of inventory on the threads that are in the system to understand what's going on. Okay. Um, if we're able to saturate the CPU, then I want to ask the question, are we memory efficient? Um, and to understand, answer this question, that I'm in Java, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, do uh, an analysis of the garbage collection, the data coming from the garbage collection log, so I can calculate uh, different metrics that are going to help me answer this particular question. Um, if we are memory efficient, then I'm going to say that um, we have application as dominating consumer, which means that we have some algorithmic strength uh, issues, which means I'm going to go into the realm of actual uh, CPU profiling. Getting back to memory efficiency, um, 
for not very efficient, I'm going to say JVM is dominating consumer. At which point, point I'm going to say that we have two paths that we might go down, and we might have to go down both, right? So one of them is what I call a technical tuning of the garbage collector itself, and the other one is what I would call uh, profiling uh, the application for uh, memory efficiency and trying to do a memory strength reduction uh, in the application. And it's possible that you might need to do uh, both of these things. Okay? So this is really the methodology and it's laid out into a flow chart and I would um, like to believe that this is going to cover most of the problems. Now this is not the only way you can tackle a problem, but in my experience this is the most efficient way to tackle problems. Generally, using this type of uh, flow chart, I can, I'm going to gather the data that I need fairly cheaply, right up, right up front. I can do the analysis very quickly, generally within a matter of seconds. And um, I can really get an understanding of what the problem is that I'm facing. Um, generally before I walk through the door of uh, any organization where I'm going to tune something. Um, you might see there's some interesting aspects of this, like um, uh, with this type of analysis, I don't care what your application is doing. I don't need to look at code. I don't need to read code. Um, I don't need to understand uh, what your architecture is uh, right up front. I can just do this analysis. I'm going to get a good understanding, an unbiased understanding of what your problem is, and then I can discover the other information as I need it. And so that way it's highly efficient. That means I can walk in and out of organizations uh, fairly quickly. Um, um, using this model, I found that I've actually not only go to a fixed price model for solving performance problems, I've been forced to. Um, because um, the last problem I solved for a company in Germany, we had a one hour conversation where I had to talk to them for a while. I did 15 minutes of analysis, I did 15 minutes to write out the emails and give them the recommendations as to what to do. We implemented them, we were done. Two hour, hour and a half work, right? This is a problem I've been facing for several months. So we went to fixed cost because for me it's not worth it um, for a regular billing rate to actually do that work like an out time and materials. So, we, the, so these type of engagements for me have become more value propositions. So, so what's the value to the customer in terms of getting this thing fixed? What's it worth in that case, right? So that's the way we charge. Um, and being fixed costs, I always take the risk. If I'm wrong, I'm going to eat it. So I don't want to be wrong. Yeah. So, um, how, how many so, people are working in that area with you? What, who's your competitor? Who's my competitor uh, for, oh, there's, a, there's all kinds of people that will claim to do performance tuning, and there's actually some people that can do the performance tuning, but when it comes to uh, certain specialties like the GC tuning, um, then uh, let's see, there's, uh, let's see, oh, uh, that are freelancing, not that many. Uh, Nitsen Walker, probably one, is really good, really extremely good. Um, Mark Thompson is extremely good, but he doesn't do much tuning, he actually does a lot more coding. I think he does some tuning. There, there's a few people around, there's about maybe uh, there's a dozen. They're pretty much they're all on our mailing list. So we have a mailing list, friends of Jay Clarity, and uh, pretty much all of the uh, people who do any type of performance tuning are engaged on that particular mailing list, or they're on the mechanical sympathy uh, mailing list. Would you, would you consider it an opportunity for somebody to start learning that as a uh, uh, more fragmented and complicated? Um, I would say that, um, yeah, uh, certainly joining some of these mailing lists, like the hotspot mailing list for sure. Um, to keep track of what's going on, and if you do, if you just want to learn and have access to people, then um, certainly uh, going to like the JVM Language Summit. One is in J Focus in Sweden in February, so that's just finished. It's probably the most open and best one, but there's also the JVM Language Summit in July um, in um, in in the San Francisco area. Uh, but that one is going to be a little bit more difficult uh, for people to break into. Right? 
So I, I can actually show this with code. So we can actually do this as a group if you want. Um, and if you just want to go back in Q&A. Because, um, I mean, you're looking at this and it, it sometimes it, it, it sort of doesn't make sense until you've tried it yourself. You know? You're looking at it going like, okay, I think I see that. But when you actually do it yourself, um, then you can see that, um, that you can actually get pretty far with this type of methodology in terms of being very quickly able to resolve uh, performance issues. I'd say, who of you has not been at today's workshop? Hands up. Just to everyone, yeah. So I think it makes sense to go through it. If you want to see a quick Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah I'm not sure I can, I can do it. I'm, I wasn't prepared for this, so it'll take me one second just to get prepared. And I don't, so, OK. So I did say one second, right? So we're prepared. <laughs> <laughs> this whole thing. Uh, so, um, oh, right, I'm going to do my microphone stand. I will. Ah, uh, man, I'm lucky. You know, uh, we've traveled around a lot together, so <laughs> we end up doing lots of stuff for each other. Oh. It's the Kirk and Sebastian team. Yeah, well, it's not just, you know, there's a few of us, right? Okay, so I'm just going to make this large enough and readable. So we have an application here, and it's going to compile it, and we're going to uh, run it. And actually, before we run it, we should actually do the sensible thing is to make sure that um, how we're running it is uh, done in a sensible way. So I'm, one of the things I'm always doing is to check the sensible things, make sure everything is some sort of organized functional state. So in this case here, I'm just going to turn on GC logging, because that's one of the key metrics that we're going to use to understand what's going on. Uh, but as for other flags, I have no evidence to say I should set or unset anything, so it's just as it is. Okay? So just straight up. The, normally, when we start one of these engagements, we might just, you know, especially we're benching, we're just going to strip everything out. Right? And just start from scratch, and we'll use uh, measurements and, and uh, the evidence presented by the exercise in order to understand how we set what needs to be set. Um, in most cases, um, well, it's quite common, you'll have places will have like maybe 30 some odd flags set, and when we're done, we might have like three or four. So it just makes it easier to understand what's going on. Okay, oh, lovely. So that's okay, so we can just, did I compile? Yeah, I did, All right. So we can just run this. Before we run this, if we're gonna use the CPU to help us identify what's going on, then we should, have some monitoring, so I'm going to use dumb monitoring here, and hopefully, let's turn off the network. Um, let's see what else is, yeah, I had some problem with noise before, so my CPU is quite noisy for some reason. Because I, I noticed there's some jump running, so I, I you know, stripped it, so I didn't get it through the start stuff and strip it out. I don't know it's going to go. Yeah, okay, well, it's mostly calm now. It's, it's probably good enough. It's not great, but it's good enough. Okay, um, so, and, oh, right. I'm gonna, I, rather than muck around with uh, going to unified logging, I'm just gonna backtrack. I, I don't know why I put a 152, but it's as good as anything. Uh, okay, so, um, Let's just run it. And the goal here is, like, before we start, we should have a goal. And the goal here is to get this thing to run in under three seconds. So um, we have time for questions. Any questions? So far? Yeah? Oh, one up front again. Yeah, what so else? this application in general? Uh, does stuff. That's <laughs> slow. Yeah. All right. It, it, yeah. It's it, calculating pi to 1.3 million digits. No, I, 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 I actually want to get a hold of that application because I want to just have some fun with it. Because, uh, you know, there's some other stuff that we've done actually for, uh, um, it'd be interesting to take that thing and like put it into some sort of like scalable microservices architecture and just, 
show people how uh, you can really mess things up with uh, microservices. Yeah. Uh, why not? Uh, why not we're, partitioning we're, the problem properly? For those of the audience, we're talking about last month's presentation on yeah. Pi calculation. Yeah. It's on so YouTube. We, so we can do this. Uh, yeah, okay, so uh, like I did say, we could have some good Q&A while this is running, right? So here we go. This, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you right up front, that it, it, people generally like this because um, it's like a good magic trick. You guys think you're in control, and you're really not, right? And, and you get the amazing result that, that, that you expect, right? And you think that you brought us there, but you actually haven't. There's only one way to go if you follow the data. And so if we follow the flow chart that we have and we follow the data, there's only one way to go. Are you? Know, hasn't been two minutes. Yeah. How many workers do you have? 20? I don't know. A bunch. What do you what are we worried about that for? Maria? All right. Wow, look at that. 119 seconds. So just shy of two minutes. And we said this can run under three seconds. Actually, under the right conditions, we could probably get it under two seconds. All right? So the first question we're going to ask here is, who's the dominating consumer? Um, system, right? Do your system? Excellent. Good answer. Whoever answered that, really good. Okay. System is dominating consumer. So, uh, so since system is dominating consumer, we want to find out, you know, what's making, you know, why is there so little uh, application activity that's really pressing really hard on the, uh, uh, it's pressing really hard on the kernel, getting the kernel to be hyperactive. Um, for some silly philosophical uh, mumbo jumbo reasons, the um, JVM is not well integrated into operating systems, and it should be. But does everybody know or agree that the system is the dominating consumer? They don't have to know or agree. That's, that's what it is. Yeah, it looked like it from the CPU group. Yeah. So the red the, the, yeah the red stuff is very. Uh, Prominent, yeah. And there's other tools we can use to. to, to it's still that. prominent on the top. Yeah, that's yeah. Just on you know, Mac OS and stuff. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, let's just say that Macs have been a little funky in the last couple of releases. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, so so the problem is uh, so we're system dominant. Um, so let's bring some tools to bear uh, to try to understand why the system might be dominant. Um, uh, well, the first tool we can bring to bear is our brain, right? So wh what, activities would what activities would require extensive use of the kernel? I.O. I.O. Disk or network, yeah? Network, probably not, because I... Turn the network off. I turned the network off. That was, <laughs> that was to try to quiesce the CPU, not, no other reason. Uh, but yeah, there's, okay. That's good. And so maybe disk I.O.? Okay. So I could run the test, we could run I.O. stack here, and you would see that there's no disk I.O. There is no disk I.O. Um, um, so I'll just speed things up rather than run the test by telling you that. Okay. Um, any other options? Memory. Mm. Any other options? <laughs> Virtual memory. Any other options? <laughs> What's left? There's lots left, dude. Well, actually, there's not. You know, the one thing I like about this methodology is it leaves you with short lists, and I love short lists, right? It's like when my wife sends me to the grocery store, she knows it's got to be a short list or it's going to be written down. I'm just not going to remember it. So, so what's the short list after I have only memory? Context switching. Context switching. Context switching is not a problem, but it is a symptom of an underlying problem, and it will certainly drive CPU uh, kernel times through the roof. Okay? So possibly context switching is a, is a, is a problem here. 
right? So probably not I.O. Oh, I told you not I.O. So context switching is the symptom of some sort of um, uh, contention problem. Okay, so let's uh, let's take a look. Oh, right, sorry. <laughs> Uh, man. Let's start. Whoops. Stop and work. Yeah, stop shutting. <laughs> I like that. Let's bring up Visual VM here. Um, and let's just run this again. So I put a little halt in here so we can get some tools um, basically attached up. Let's get rid of that for now. Um, so I'm just going to do attach here. Or attach, or attach, or attach. Let's just look at the threads. Um, Take out the thread inspector so we can actually see. Let's make it big. Whoop. Isn't that fun? I like that. Um, hit the go and then watch what happens. Boom, 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 boom. Look at that. What does the red mean? Monitor. Yay. Okay. So if we're lucky, maybe we can do a profile here, a single sample profile called the thread dump. Take a look. See lots of red? Threads blocked on monitor. That's just, yeah, boom. Okay. Who likes reading thread dumps? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> After having read thousands upon thousands of thread dumps, I'm going to tell you. The less I see them, the better off. Okay, so let's take a look at something, a reasonable tool for looking at thread dumps. TDA, thread dump analysis tool. Um, let's see if I can just get this centered off here so we can make it big. But you know what? You guys sit in the back. If you can't see it, move up or suffer. That's all I can say. <laughs> uh, we can only make the tool so big. Um, the font so big. So, um, so this is... This is a really kind of cool tool because you can define filters and filter sets to actually scan through the thread dumps and then drop them into different categories. So I have filter sets and things that help you find um, uh, threads in different conditions or threads from different thread pool products and you know different application servers, whatever. So if you get a bunch of thread dumps, you can actually uh, start poking around and seeing something. But in this case, we're interested in monitors, right? So let's just go to the monitor category. We got a big red thing here for a monitor. So let's just open up the big red thing, because that's generally bad. And now we can see um, some stuff here happening. And, whoops. Okay. Anybody got any ideas now? Sorry? One thing is for another resource. I didn't understand. Did you understand? Sorry. It's like one thread is looking for another resource. It's looking for another resource. Deadlock. 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 Yes. No, no, deadlock is deadlock is when you have a thread that's waiting for an event that's never going to happen. No syncing. Right. So there's no deadlock here because these these things are happening. But there certainly is contention on the lock. Yeah. Okay. What should we do now? Nuke it. Nuke it. Yeah, nuke. Okay, here we are. Yeah, turn it to glass, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, let's press the enter and get out of there. Okay, and let's look at some code. Because we're developers. If we can't look at code, I mean, what can we do? What code do we look at? Uh, so what's this one? Person story, which find person by name. Wow, so we have even a vector in the code, so it's really kind of fun. And notice I'm going to use VI here, because that's real programmers use VI. Yes. <laughs> Old school. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so what line were we at? Uh, yeah. Find person by name, line 24. 24 is there. Yes. Yes, I know. It's a beautiful piece of code. It's a work of art. I'm going to edit this. Any suggestions? It's only one word or can do that. Ah! Brilliant observation. 
Only one worker can do this at a time. Is that because it's synchronized? Is that because it's synchronized? Yeah, I think so. I love how you say synchronized. Can you say that again? Synchronized. <laughs> All right, okay. Synchronized. This is good. Just get rid of that keyword. Who needs it anyways? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. Yeah, we can just set up a set script to go through everything. Just like you know, just like nuke the synchronized. Who needs it anyways? Okay. Remind me. I'm pretty if you for recommendations or anything. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. What are we gonna do? Any Java code? Here? Or are you all like Python weenies? And, and, and this is people. the machine learning group? Yeah, this is the machine learning group. Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, I don't want to be here all night, so I'm just going to do it myself. <laughs> you already have a synchronized map, right? Yeah. And then you're synchronizing all the functions that are accessing. Yeah. So that's silly, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but we see manifestations of this all over the place. Boom. Okay, so we don't actually need that because the map is synchronous. But wait, can we do better? Of course. Get rid of all the other ones. I have no evidence that any of the others are a problem. I am not touching them because if I touch them and I break something, you know, someone's going to sue me for like whatever. You got to pay for that like indemnity, whatever insurance thing. Bloody expensive. Okay. Quick before my battery dies. Well, we made a change. What happens if we run again so it gets away? Oh, good idea. Um, yeah, do you have unit tests? Unit tests? What do you mean unit tests? What are those? Unit tests? TDD. <sighs> yeah, that's just for the week of mine. Come on. No, no unit tests. Okay, um, I don't want to run it. Why not? Because I don't. I think we can do better. You can do better. Absolutely. Because, I, I mean, there's two points of synchronization there, right? So that means you acquire one lock, then you acquire the other lock, then you do, then you escape out, and nobody gets in there until they acquire both locks, one after the other. So just getting rid of one means that instead of getting two, we now just have to get one. We still have the same problem. So it's going to take about... Well, it might actually run in 90 seconds. 99 seconds now. Right? What but that's that whittling around the edge thing. Okay? What did the trace say? What was the, what did the, the trace, trace say? Edge? That's what the trace said. But I mean, you don't need the trace. I mean, you've already identified the problem. It's synchronization, right? So, you know, get rid of synchronization. You're right, get rid of synchronized. Yeah. Okay. So you want to get but rid we of still need it to be thread safe. Where is the best place to be thread safe? In the fingers or in the you don't want to or at the clocks? Is your arm getting sore? <laughs> or use a different hash man. I heard something. Did somebody say that something like that? Whoops. Yeah, you got it ready. Right okay. Use the right object. Use the right data structure, dude. Data structures, that's where it's at. Okay. So, let's go to a concurrent hash map. Whoops. So fix it in your import. <sighs> My undo, undid gets too much. That's the other. Okay. So let's compile that. And, ooh, look at that. You did not use the concurrent hash map. Hmm? You did not use the concurrent hash map. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Thank you. You listen too much to Paul and get rid, got rid of all the synchronization. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Thanks. I know I've seen that. That would have been embarrassing. Uh, okay, so now we can run it, right? So hold on. CPU, CPU, CPU. Is there CPU? Where do we start? 120 seconds? There we go. Good enough. Let's run it. You're rolling. 
Enter, here we go. Kaboom. Bit of bang. Seven seconds. Victory? Not yet. Not yet. Right? Three seconds, yeah? Okay. Now, we ask the same question. Who's the dominating consumer in the CPU? Application. Could be. Any other choices? Not here. JVM, right? JVM, yeah. Oh, oh cool. Okay, so awesome. So yeah. now we need to tease apart the JVM from the application. That's where we use the GC log. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Oh, man. Okay, so I have my nice Sensum tool for doing this. Let's uh, blast out of existence. Goodbye. Analyze the GC log. Let's make it smaller again so I can make it bigger. Oh yeah, we have a GC log right there. Okay, so I can open that up. Does the analytics and here. Oh wait, there's more, right? Uh, <clears throat> okay, so what is it saying here? Um, well, it's complaining we have calls to system GC. So we have a number of analytics that will actually go through um, the logs, and depending on how much data is around, it'll actually do different bits of analytics. The of course, I'm not triggering the interesting analytics, so they actually haven't shown up here. For instance, we do a CPU analytic. It can tell you if you have noisy neighbors or not. Different bits of things like that. So we've, we've actually had uh, customers uh, call us and say, uh, we have long GC pauses, can you come and help us? And we'll, we'll get the data from them and we'll say, no, your GC pauses are just fine. You've got something else running in your environment that's interfering with everything. And let's go fix that instead. So it really saves them a lot of time and money because instead of trying to tune a garbage collector, which is not going to yield them any useful results, uh, we ended up punting, uh, in one case, an Oracle instance uh, that was running on the same server that they were trying to run their e-commerce application. And yeah, they only had two network cards on that box, which is the Oracle instance that saturated. And we got all of that from GC analysis, actually. So, or the, the, at least we, the thread we needed to pull on started with the GC analysis. Okay, um, cool. So, let's see. Summary, uh, 90, application throughput, 99.1%. Actually, your, our total pause time is 87 milliseconds. So 6.9 whatever seconds minus 87 milliseconds is still greater than three, right? So even if we get rid of all garbage collection, we still have an issue. Okay, so this doesn't look like it's going to turn up very much. Um, let's look at allocation rates. And our allocation rates here are about eight gigabytes per second. Okay, and what do we think of that? This is the point where I should all start laughing. I mean, a gigabyte per second. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Thanks, Paul. Okay, so, so, yeah, so there's a few magic numbers you have to know, right? I gave you one magic number already, that was 10%, and, you know, that's completely made up, but, you know, it works. It's very cool. And there's another magic number I'm going to give you, and that's one gig per second. So if you're above one gig per second, you have a churn problem. And it doesn't really matter what hardware you're on, believe it or not, one gig per second is the magic number, right? It is today, at least, and probably will be tomorrow and the day after. Okay, so, thank you, so. Okay, so, um, so we, have an app, we have a churn problem, which basically means JVM is dominating consumer, not application, sorry, good guess, but. Um, which means that, okay, let's figure out where the churn is coming from now. Awesome. So I'm going to go back to Visual VM. I'm going to hook up a memory profile. How's that? Profiler, memory. Okay, so we're, we're preset here with the filters. Do I do my filter joke? Okay, I do my filter joke, right? Um, so when you use a profiler, make sure you understand what the filter settings are because the 
most useful thing you're going to get from a lot of these filters is that the profile, sorry, the bottleneck will be filtered out of your profile. Generally not a desirable thing, but that was a joke, by the way. You can stop <laughs> laughing again. You can start laughing again. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Yes, that's, that's the obligatory laugh. There you go. Um, yeah. God, it's been a long day. Let's <laughs> laugh again. You guys work too hard, or you just start? Okay. They work too hard. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. No sense of humor. Okay, so let's. Okay, we're instrumented, we're running, and you know. Um, okay, so I'm going to say that uh, the allocation churn problem is a frequency problem, so I want to just look for allocated objects. The all allocated objects is going to give me a inference of what the uh, churn rate is. Okay? I look at this as a frequency event, not a volume event. And anything standing out? Character array? Awesome. Character array? Yeah, let's go take a look at that. Yeah. Okay. Reminds me of the pi calculator. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, okay, so let's go after the character A and let's just open it up, follow the, you know, and there we go. What a surprise. See all that? That's our, that's our uh, allocation. Um, Path, right to the car array um, allocation site. Okay, fantastic. So we've got an idea of what's going on there. Were we looking at that piece of code before? Said, Who wrote that? Honestly. Um, yeah. Okay. So again, anybody any questions about that? Next, uh, let's go through here. Anybody? Got anything? Any questions about that? Any ideas what to do now? We'll look at that code. Okay. Now before we look at the code, notice this here. Int, int, int. You see what that is? Okay. Okay. Remember that. Put that in the back of your brain. That that could be useful information. Maybe. Maybe not. Let's see. Okay. What's going on here? Let go. Let go of my process. Okay. Um, cool. Cool. So there we are. Find person by name. Okay. My gosh. Where's the string builder at end? That little plus sign. Come on. Uh, I can't fool you. <laughs> That's the uh, little plus sign. Okay. So what are you going to do to get rid of the churn here? Get rid of the plus sign. <laughs> It is just the right script. So there's not all the plus signs in my code. Excellent. Okay. So. You mean like that? Is that going to work now? Yeah, probably not. <laughs> uh, we got String Builder over here on the right. But it's already using String Builder. Yeah, it's built in this thing. Yeah, so that's not going to help. Buffer, String Buffer. String Buffer, String Builder, same thing. They're just, they're, they just have different wrapper classes on them. I can't finish the demo. See what it's like. How do you concatenate two strings without creating a third? You know the old joke, right? It's a Groucho Marx, right? Doctor, it hurts when I do that. Then don't, don't do that. that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's really fun. What if you use a pen? What? A pen. A pen. What do you mean a pen? A string a pen? Which means that uses an underlying string builder? Yeah. Awesome. We, we've already, we were trying to get rid of that. That's the don't do that part of it. <laughs> doctor, doctor, hurts. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, let's go and put in something like this. So when you do a table lookup with uh, two or more fields, the two or more fields form what we call a composite, a composite key. key. Awesome. So let's introduce the abstraction of a composite key into this piece of code. Yeah? What do you think of that? Is that going to be fun? It's kind of like getting rid of the plus. 
is kind of like getting rid of the plus sign. It is getting rid of the plus sign. It's not kind of like. Uh, And where did you find the class composite key? Ah, uh, mysteries about. There you go. A mysterious composite key. Is that going to compile? I'm going to mess up. OK. Let's run that. Let's get our CPU running up. What was our target? Three seconds. What else can go wrong? You clear. Absolutely nothing. Yeah, absolutely nothing. OK. One, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. There we go. Boom. There. And, and, boom. Wow. So where'd you get composite key? <coughs> it's a class that I had pre-written that's in there because, of course, I knew it. You know, so. <laughs> it's like any good magic trick. You know? That's right. You stack the deck. Stack the deck. Exactly. Okay. That's the methodology, right? And we can apply that. Uh, so that's our methodology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's the mobile mic. I got that. Um, and uh, okay, so that's a very small problem, but we can actually apply this to any size problem, and that's effectively how it works. And it, as I said, it's bias free. Let us in. Well, I didn't tell you what the applications do it was doing. We only looked at the code that we need. Solve the problem directly, and when we've got rid of the primary bottlenecks, we can have massive gains in performance. That's all we want. That's all we want. Okay? It's very structured. It didn't and take us very long. Anything else. And you know, if you want, I uh, can pull up another one and we can do it again. Completely different problem. Okay. okay. Questions now? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. I might have missed it. Is there a is there a trick that you did to avoid creating new objects there that we did yeah, I created a new object. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I guess it's it it instantiating the new object every day. Yeah, so I, so I created a new composite object, and um, when I created a new composite object, uh, what I did was I avoided the string concatenation, and it actually creates three objects and does a cop and a red copy in there. Okay? So, yeah, so that's a heck of a lot cheaper, as you saw, because we went from six seconds to two seconds. Did that um, made that, that that particular change right? Don't use strings in your application. Use integers. <laughs> <laughs> How did you know? How did you know? No, seriously. Pi, I calculate need... pi. Use integers. <laughs> right. So uh, yeah, I told. I mean, I told that joke in the past day, so I'll, I'll repeat that in the workshop. It was like you know, I don't expose technical classes in any API. I'm always going to have a domain class there. I'm not passing in or passing out things like hash map, you know, and, and I like into this. So this is the really bad joke that I tell, right? It's like you don't hear things in the office like, Fred, can you pass the hash map to me? All right? It's like more like, can you pass the customer list to me? Or can you pass the Rolodex to me? Or can you pass, you know, whatever the contact list, whatever it actually is, right? I mean, these things are effectively collections. but they're not hash maps, or they're not whatever. It's they're, they, they actually have state and they have behavior. And, and one of the things uh, you know, that, I, you know, that we stressed in the workshop today is like, do you have string util class in your hierarchy? Right? If you have string util class in your hierarchy, that to me is a code smell that you're abusing strings and you actually have behavior in there that you're not properly modeling and you're not properly encapsulating that state. If you start properly modeling and encapsulating the state, then these classes like string util disappear. You have collections of collections. Uh, there's all kinds of these different code styles you see these, where you get really bad abstractions, and surprisingly, because you have bad abstractions, you actually end up with bad performance in your system. Right? So it's part of the code. So you, I would, one of the arguments I make is that the code that we finish with is easier to read because it better expresses intent. When you see a composite key, you know that, okay, that's the thing that I'm going to use to do a lookup in a table. That's what it implies in the model. If I see two strings on, on a line, it's like, oh, you know, okay, what the hell's that? I, I, I better read more code to figure it out. 
Okay? So good code actually performs very well. Simple code performs very well. A couple more questions and then we get into the drawing. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a couple of uh, magic numbers, the 10% kernel versus uh, user space time. Also, I have no clue. The one gigabyte per second on the you know, allocation rate. And so, are those just metrics you get lead from experience and just trial and error, or is there some resource we can go to to learn more about uh, some um, things? Those are my numbers. Those are exclusively exclusively my numbers. I'm sharing my numbers with you. Um, and um, those are I've made them up. I have no basis for those numbers actually being those numbers. Have you been able to use 42 as any of your magic numbers? <laughs> actually, yes. Ooh. I, I, no, not me, but uh, Gil Tennant actually has been able to use 42 as a magic number. And that's uh, actually um, with HTTP 1, uh, the average number of times that a page will go and hit the web server in order to grab content. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That's a useless piece of trivia that I can just throw on you right there. Okay. <laughs> but, next. Uh, <laughs> next. Yes, exactly. Final question. So, no, uh, more seriously, these are numbers that we've gleaned from experience, from actually tuning. So, we, you know, from once you've tuned enough things, you start seeing patterns and thresholds and things like that. And, and, um, and then you make them uh, sort of, you know, these, these are um, rough numbers anyways, right? So we might as well make them human memorable. We've actually verified the approximately 10% number using uh, machine learning algorithms um, and learning over a number of different systems. And the real number, I actually don't know what it is, but it's 9 point something or other, something or other, something or other, other than something. It's like, screw it. Just take, look at the data, knock off one column of numbers, like the first column of numbers, and do the comparison. It's good enough, right? Okay. So now you've identified the problems. Is there something you put into like your continuous integration or build pipeline to make sure that those metrics are enforced going forward? Um, I don't know. I just solve problems. That's somebody else's job. What do you say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, first of all, that's a very important thing to have process around it so you can build and ship the software, right? Because what we basically did, um, or what Kirk did, well, we shorted the problem by just telling you what it not is, but you basically have to do that in um, by iterations, right? So you fix something and then you look at it again because then you come up with a new uh, situation and basically you come up with a new instance of the model, right? So you have to look at, uh, at it from a new angle, by a new perspective and doing it again and again and again. And of course, you can only do so if you're able to ship your software as soon as possible. And um, earlier in the workshop, uh, we also could also mention that you have to look uh, into production in order to find these problems because the test environment will never yield the same results, right? So then again, same story. In order to go to production faster, as quickly as possible, you have to have a continuous delivery process be in place, right? Yeah, I, I did that nice demo where we showed the, uh, I showed the demo where the test environment gave different results than the production environment. It's, it's a fun demo. But it's, a, it's an out-of-memory error that just randomly occurs in one environment that doesn't occur in another environment. It's really fun. I like breaking things. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is when Paul says, do you have any more questions? Uh, any. Any final questions in here? Yes, sir. What might be the reason that they got the they out of number? Okay. Um, so I'm going to come back here and give you more points. What might be the reason that they got the number? What might be causing that? Yes. Oh, uh, well, I don't know. Um, different versions of the JDK. I mean, the, 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 some of the implementations change between builds. interesting time space trade-offs and they realize that maybe not the right way to go back and so they just go work to play combinations environments that all sudden things happen. I, I had this happen once in the beginning in, in, in Sweden. 
I gave a demo of it. I thought I was going to be triaging one set of problems, and I ended up triaging a, um, a leak in of a spring object in a J text box. I didn't even know they were there. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I started going through the process here that we did, and it was a completely different problem. And when I was looking at the data, I said, okay, I can't be telling them to follow the data and myself not follow the data. And this problem just showed up in this one field where we had the spring widget was leaking. And so <clears throat> I didn't actually know at the time we started the demo. And so I just said, okay, fine. We've got a memory leak. Let's just diagnose the memory leak. The diagnostic process, everyone thought the top was supposed to be the top, so it's cool. And at the end, we just follow the box and hey, we got a screen widget and we can disappear in the So, I don't think anyone realized that I was actually confronting the memory um, first time. Uh, anyways, and, and it's not really that scary because if you're just following the process and then follow the rest of the things, you're, you're just doing what you're doing. All the talk should be just doing what you're doing. Okay, you were going to give away a cue. Oh, oh cue is the best, best question. Or yes. Why are you just drop a number? No, I, 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 we said the, the cue goes to the best question, so. Okay, come over here. We're going to, you, you can start with this first. And the best question. Yeah, yeah. How many people think they remember what the questions were? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is one of the things. Being the owner of the okay, we're, we're, oh, wait, wait, we're back. The judges have conferred. Okay. So we had a yeah, we, we had a lot of good questions. It's really tough. It took us a long time and yeah, a lot of good questions, really tough. As you can see, it took us a long time to come to, to a conclusion. Uh, but I think you have to please stand up and yes. Ah, the process guy. Yes, very good. Actually, I think he deserves it. Yes. It's the process and the conference. Sorry? Topic. It's the process and the conference topic. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Thank you. I'm from Bulgaria, by the way. I'm here by chance in San Diego. Bulgaria? Sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just so for two days in San Diego and possibly in San Where are you going to Sofia? I've been to Abbey and Think. San Francisco. Oh, yeah. okay. So are you from Sofia then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So do you go to J. Um This is what I was talking with uh, my mate on the table that uh, the Java user group in Bulgaria is very strong. Very nice. Yeah. And J. Prime is like 1,000 plus people. And That's I think the best. I in Sofia and San Diego are more or less the same cities. Like we are like almost 2,000, but not significantly bigger. Yeah. And the Java community is very strong. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. I, I spoke to Jake Prime last year. Great, great. Yes, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. I actually drove from Hungary to Sofia, spoke to Jake Prime, then drove to Athens, spoke at the uh, Box Days in Athens, and yeah. then drove to Crete to stay there until we had our conference. Yeah, it's so strong it's and fun fantastic project. Yeah. 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 I'll be there this year actually at Jake Prime. Yeah. Yeah. So, You're going to be there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. See you there. <laughs> yeah, it's a great conference. Thank you. If you want to see yeah, a big part of the world and see a great conference, that would be it. So who, who else is visiting from around the world to the SDJ? Yeah. Yeah. Well, who's going to J-Prime? J-Prime? She's going for J-Prime. It's awesome. Oh, yeah. Okay. So.